Let's talk about value in general. Um, this is sometimes called in philosophy axiology. Uh, and I suppose, broadly speaking, it is the topic of the um, second half of Entanglements, a system of philosophy. So the stuff I'm going to do uh, in this in this go round um, is drawn from the introduction to part two, and it has to do with the question of what values are. Now, uh, you know, uh, I guess paradigmatic cases of value include things like beauty, um, moral goodness, justice. And you know it's it's a it's a, it's one of the great questions of I guess of Western uh, political philosophy or Western uh, philosophy in general, what the status uh, or the ont the ontology of value is, uh, whether values are things in the world, or things in the head, or things in the culture, or the language, for example. Um, so I would say that. For many centuries, in a way, uh, Western philosophy was caught in the dilemma about whether value, values were objective facts about the world or whether values were subjective responses, emotional responses, for example, uh, of approval and disapproval um, happening in the mind of the experiencer or the judger or the uh, person that has the values. Uh, and I would say in the 20th century that uh, in many ways the 20th century was the century of the social and uh, also and relatedly the, the um, era of the golden era of language in philosophy or a focus on language as a potential tool of elucidation, uh, but also potential, as it were, source of uh, confusion, but also perhaps source of uh, things like values. Um, so I, I say that this idea that beauty must be subjective or objective or cultural, this trilemma, um, is it's a crushing false dilemma. Uh, but it also can be used to show the status of values as situations. That is, the status of values as um, examples of the kind of ontology that I've, I'm putting forward in entanglements, uh, according to which all things are, uh, are situations, let's say. All right. Or in which we must characterize each thing by its relations rather than by its intrinsic properties. All right, now uh, a good place to start, I say, is beauty. It's an exemplary value from my point of view. I did write a book about it called Six Names of Beauty. Um, and, you know, really a, a, a lot, I mean, the discussion, I guess, of beauty in the Western tradition kind of just ran aground on this question of subjectivity. Uh, and once beauty is regarded as subjective, no, I mean, it's no wonder that it fades from discussion as one of the ultimate uh, values or even one of the central questions of philosophy, right? If it's merely subjective, it means whatever I want it to mean, it applies to whatever I want it to apply to, there's really nothing more to be said. In fact, if that's the case, it's not a concept at all. Uh, and it could be safely ignored for the next, you know, few millennia. But um, I, I say that that's uh, a terribly sad and falsifying view about beauty. Right? When I say that the world is beautiful or this little, uh, uh, it's a beautiful day, um, I'm not describing my own state of consciousness. I'm attempting to say something about the world. All right? I'm not saying I'm having a pleasure. I'm characterizing the world, at least apparently. Right? Uh, you know, I've been messing with G.E. Moore uh, in previous sections in the epistemology chapter in particular. And Moore's realism 
I think, which is my realism too, uh, motivated a reconstruel of values, both aesthetic and ethical, in Moore's philosophy, that I think makes essentially the right move. Uh, so I'm going to give you a little uh, bit of Moore. Uh, this is from Principia Ethica, characterizing beauty. It has been commonly supposed that the beautiful may be defined as that which produces certain effects upon our feelings. And the conclusion that follows from this, namely, that judgments of taste are merely subjective, that precisely the same thing may, according to circumstances, be both beautiful and not beautiful, has very frequently been drawn. But to assert that a thing is beautiful is to assert that the cognition of it is an essential element in one of the intrinsically valuable wholes we have been discussing, all right, and that it's a, a uh, when he says a whole, he's saying um, a whole situation that encompasses the external object and the cognition and the emotional, the, the experience of the object, the empirical experience of the object, and the emotional response to that cognition. So that the question whether it is truly beautiful or not depends upon the objective question whether the whole in question is or is not truly good and does not depend upon the question of whether it would or would not excite particular feelings in particular persons. Right. Um, that is, the beauty, beauty is a feature of the situation. And the way I want to frame this, uh, and this is the ontological status of all values insofar as they're real, and I believe I'm going to I'm, I'm going to assert that my position is that values exist in the world. Right? If you if you have to have this word word objective, they're perfectly objective in that they exist in the material world. But values are situations that encompass an experiencer, all right, someone experiencing a situation, they encompass features of that situation or that situation, more broadly speaking, and they encompass a vocabulary and a set of cultural practices with regard uh, to the values in question, all right. Beauty or moral goodness, for example, is not a feature of subjective uh, emotional response. It's not a feature of the objective world outside of any experiencers. And it's not merely a feature of the cultural practices um, that are used to describe it or articulate it. But all those are parts of a, an array in the entanglement, <laughs> uh, a way of organizing oneself and in, one's, in relation to one's culture and one's physical surround um, in order to, you know, build a universe of value. Now, uh, so the universe itself is beautiful. If I said that, right, I'd be talking about holistic qual a holistic quality of, uh, you know, everything that is. I might be thinking that it's well ordered in some way, or that it, you know, it's, it displays great elegance in terms of uh, richness of phenomena deriving from a few uh, physical laws given an initial situation, for example, that has beauty in a kind of Occam's razor sort of way, right? And that might well inform my uh, science. Stephen Hawking makes that kind of uh, elegance the first principle of science, of, of determining truth in science, truth for theories, for example. All right. And as these things are showing, I hope, I also think that moral value, epistemic value, aesthetic value, political value, these are all in play in any given situation. And they're very complexly interrelated and their relations between one another, things like truth and moral goodness, are compositional. All right. So I don't think, I think you have to broaden out to a kind of holistic treatment of values in relation to one another. Uh, you know, for example, I mean, in some ways, this, this, the status I'm ascribing to values is like the status you might ascribe to color. All right. 
it might make some sense to say that there, is, there are no colors in a universe without color perceivers. It, but that's not to say that color is a merely a phantasm, all right, as, say, Locke would have it, or an idea in the mind of the perceiver that, Locke, that uh, colors are subjective or secondary, whereas, uh, you know, extension in space or something is objective, for example. Um, but what a color, uh, what, what having color in the universe may require is it may be a situation where you need perceivers, right? You need objects in an environment. You need those things to interact, like light reflecting off of objects into, literally through the holes in the body into uh, the body of the uh, perceiver. And you might need a color vocabulary, okay? And it may be that different, somewhat different color vocabularies can handle the phenomenon, okay? Phenomena, okay, as well. Um, but so the status I'm ascribing to values, the ontological status, as situations encompassing an experiencer, an environment, other experiencers, a cultural surround, a, link, a, a vocabulary, a set of representational resources for conveying the experience. Um, that's the kind of status we could ascribe to a lot of properties. That doesn't mean they're not real, okay? Because experiencers are real. We're real. We're experiencing these things with our bodies, man. A situation that embeds me as an experiencer, it's ob as objective as anything uh, can be. Objective or you know actual experiences, actual uh, not experiences, actual events are happening in my brain. All right, uh, and the situation of value encompasses that things like that, my brain, let's say, and the inputs into my brain through the holes in my face, uh, and also encompasses a set of cultural values, and those two are in the real world in such in some sense they're. In, in a, their material situations, if they're anything at all, right? and encompasses an environment which I'm experiencing in which all this, the culture and the individual perceptual apparatus, has to be designed to respond to. These are responses to the real world, right? or else they are leading us toward annihilation. Uh, so, uh, that in brief is the, uh, the general treatment of axiology, and uh, next I'll go on to do some ethics and specifically talk about the free will problem in philosophy. Um, and I want to say that the basic approach I'll take is that I want to detach the concept of free will from the concept of responsibility, moral responsibility. I think you can be morally responsible even if you are not acting freely. So I'm going to give that argument uh, whenever I get to the next bit. Just another beautiful spring day out here, man. Awful sweet. All right.